Welcome to Green and Red, Scrappy Politics for Scrappy People, a regular podcast on radical environmental and anti capitalist politics. Brought to you by Bob Bazanka and Scott Parkin. Special episode today. We are joined by the founders of the Church of Stop Shopping, Reverend Billy and Savitri D. Welcome to the Green and Red podcast, y'all. And you're, you're on the road, you're on tour. Yes. Thank you. Good to see you. Highway yeah. 95. Yeah, we're cruising up Highway 95 between New York City and Mansfield, Massachusetts, which is right between Boston and Providence, Rhode Island. And we're on the road with Neil Young and Crazy Horse on the Love Earth Tour. And you and the choir and the Church of Stop Shopping are performing with Neil or as an opening act or, or something along those lines? Yeah. Yeah, we're the opening act for for Neil Young and Crazy Horse. And yeah, in the in the record business, they call it the support act. But I, I like opening better. How did, What's the tour about it? How did you guys get involved with it? Love Earth is the unlikely name of the tour um, for a commercial rock tour. It's an unusual name. But... Anybody who knows anything about Daryl Hannah and Neil Young and their work over the years, of course, it's quite predictable. They are dedicated to solutions to the Earth's crisis. And I believe I met Daryl when she was in, involved with Montauk Removal Coal Mining, got arrested with Dr. Hansen that time when the, uh, when the grade school had a gigantic uh, leak of coal waste. What do they call that? Sludge. Slurry. Slurry, yeah. Yeah. Just hovering on the brim of the ridge above the disaster waiting yeah. to happen. But she's also pipelines and standing rock. And Neil has always been deeply involved with agriculture and farm aid, small farms, family farms, and, and then Monsanto and their impact on uh, people and, and the land itself and our work. And they went to Dwayne Johnson's trial repeatedly. Near your office, I Scott. Dwayne Johnson is a, a gardener and who sued Monsanto and won a tremendous amount of money for contracting non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And he was the first in a series of amazing elements that have brought down the the Bayer Company, which was misguided. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but we're glad. Bring so, down the aspirin giant. I'd say this is a values-driven tour. We're we're involved because our intersect. It's not a it's not a business arrangement, exactly. We're discovering now that we've had 10 shows and we have 20 to go. Mm -hmm. And night after night, in front of 10, 20,000 people, you start looking back and there's a, a pattern. And it's... Uh, it, it Our 30 minutes and Neil Young and Crazy Horses, 90 minutes to two hours, they go together in a way. Neil has needs to... He needs to do nothing. He'll be completely eccentric and do n nothing anybody expects. But on this tour, he's 78 years old, and he is letting people hear his hits. Mm -hmm. And so his songs, he's a particular kind of singer, composer. His songs refer to a time in your life. Old man, take a look at my life. When right. You're when you're 24 and you're talking to somebody who's 80 and you're talking about life, heart of gold, I'm searching for a heart of gold. Hey, my, it's when rock and roll starts becoming old and Johnny Rotten's your new hero. Harvest Moon, of course, wonderful. Number one in the country, love song, completely romantic. Everybody knows this is nowhere as a song about Los Angeles. <laughs> I think that some people who live in Los Angeles are still under the misguided apprehension that it is somewhere. Only love can break your heart. Needle in the damage done. Addiction comes a time. The song I can't remember. Come down off the misty mountain, Rob, on the human highway. There's a, a you can just see. So we get get the privileged position of standing in the wings or standing in special spots and looking at the audience. You can see that. People are lighting up with really strong, delicious memories. 
a moment in their life mm. when one with his plaintive tenor voice and the chords to the song and they just go, oh. <laughs> you just see them falling out. Now, he does that one by one through the course of the evening. Mm -hmm. And so he sets up a time frame, which is an embrace of this thing that we call life. We come on and we're just the opposite. We're 12 people from all over the world. We're so we're presenting as not we're, we're not presenting as coming from one place. We're coming from everywhere. Our the genre of our music can't be pinned down. It like gospels, like rock, like this, like that. Tours around. We only sing five songs. And our job is to reinvigorate and intensify the present tense experience, this very moment. Which is just the opposite of Neil's responsibility. This very moment. Because as a people, we are not registering the Earth's crisis. We're not in the present tense sufficiently. We're lost in consumerism and what have you. I, mm -hmm. Bob and Scott, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right. We're, we're, we're having trouble. We're falling through space and we don't admit it. So the two go together. And we've seen the symbiosis over the starting in San Diego, then east to Atlanta through New Orleans, and then north through Washington and Philly and New York, we've, we've been watching the play of our two roles. Mm -hmm. How is the audience responding to the memory or the or, or what have you with Neo? How are they responding to your song and message around the sort of present moment and the present crises? I'm sure what, what's your answer to that question? I think that I'd be a generous person right now, but my feeling is that most people I encounter in the world, which includes the audiences of these shows, are basically seeking pleasure, mm -hmm. you know, unless they're at work, in which case they might be working and focused in a heightened way, but the pleasure seeking is, it's a concert. People want to feel good. There's only so much pushing you can do in any direction. Right. So basically, people just want to have a good time. I want to have a good time too. But for me, I have a good time when I'm really engaged with my values and I'm like engaged with working for the earth. That's when I feel the best, when I feel the integration of my my beliefs and my actions, right? That's when I feel the best. But I think that's like a broken a broken metric for a lot of us on the planet right now. If we're not in survival mode, we're seeking pleasure. So that's confusing. It's very instructive, I think, for us to be in this situation and be like encountering that modality really clearly. And because we are activists and radical in the ways that we are, we very rarely encounter or interact with commercial institutions at the level we are right now. So it's very instructive and is helping us to understand what what's happening out there in the world a lot. We're not getting this sort of activist bubble, thinking that other people also really enjoy this integration of values and action as much as I do. Because I, I, so that's a long answer to your question. I, I think the audiences enjoy us and are surprised by us. We operate in a kind of radical instability. They don't know what we are. They don't know who we are. Why are they here? But these people love Neil Young. And so they trust him in a way. So they're like, oh, if Neil likes it, maybe I should like it too, which is not necessarily the best <laughs> way to decide what you like, but I'll take it. And they've been very supportive and generous to us. And I have to say, we put on a great show. So it's not like the music's great and the choir's great and Billy's great. So it's not like they're having to swallow a bitter pill. It's a great show. And, right. that, and that we've developed that over many years. And I'd say we were operating at a very high level. Like our music is better than it's ever been. And I feel great being up there on that huge stage. I don't feel like, I feel like we belong there on that big stage we're, and we're good. But we have a real, it's a very consumerized moment as usual. And mixed with nostalgia, that's a very dangerous situation for a radical like me. Whoa, hold on. Who gets to feel good? Who gets to be safe? Who gets to watch a concert and love the music and have memories? Who gets that? No, <laughs> who gets that? So 
I'm really happy to be out here. I, I have nothing but respect for Neil Young. I just think he's a very true artist, very honest man. He is constantly reinventing and he's pushing back against a lot of really commercial forces all the time and just doing what he wants. And it turns out he he wants the earth to be a, a healthy and thriving biosystem for all the animals. So I right. credit him a lot and I'm really glad to be working with him. I feel really honored and privileged. You One thing that I think links you and Neil Young when, immediately when Scott told me we were going to be talking to you is your the things you do with regard to like consumption, consumerism, right? You're the church of Stop Shopping. And Neil Young's been an activist. He's done this notes for you, his album. But you also said people are out there seeking pleasure. How do you get this message into them about the kind of bigger role of being consumers, being in this commercial society, but also just trying to like let them enjoy the day? I, we just say what we mean. And it, it's it's inside the form of a great song. And that's the best we can come up with as far as strategies go in this situation is just to be really good. We start the part of the concert with just trying to capture everybody's other defense against the sixth extinction and how they're letting it in. We just, we just talked for a moment. Don't we have this thing happening every day where we just it just occurs to us, oh, my God, this is actually happening. And I, we have a very low level conversation before we get into the earth chorus, we and we're up there shouting in six harm, six part harmonies with drums and bass guitar and two keyboards. We're like thunderous. The sound system's outrageous. It has five 18 wheeler semi trailers pulling it around the country. Yeah, and they have their own <laughs> biodiesel tanker that follows them around. The <laughs> tanker that follows them. <laughs> so. We've never had that feeling of power on that level. Our storefront church in the East Village, yeah. is, it's about 100 per people capacity. <laughs> so we're going from 100 to 15,000 in, in a day. But the, just to get the common experience that we're all having, just to share the uh, denial that we're all that we're all going through. Because we all know that our major institutions at this point, are getting the go-ahead to crash through 1.5 Celsius. Oh, yeah. We're all, we all realize, oh, everybody's saying it's okay. Scott, we've been working with you for, what, like 20 years? Like, we all went through- 20, like 20 years seven, this year. Yeah, we've all been through seven or eight stages of grief, like beyond the stages of grief. We've, we've grieved and then grieved again and worked as hard as we can, and here we are. Our mistake was we- let them push us out of Halliburton that day, Scott. Oh, we should have God. stayed there. That was I, great. I had a, one of my questions was about that. Yeah. Uh, for the audience, Billy Salvatry and I met 20 years ago, and we crashed the cafeteria at Halliburton's headquarters in Houston with a revival in the midst of the in the midst of the cafeteria. Yeah, all the chomping. I just remember the the big burger. Everyone was eating a burger. It was so Texas. <laughs> Let's just remind people that at that time we were invading and at war what how many countries was the war on terror was at its absolute peak not that it's over i don't want to say that forever ended all of those wars are still happening but we went into that cafeteria at just at the moment when Halliburton was just wow and at the they, moment they, that ronald reagan had died so right. you told us over the phone come to the airport in your costume and so i was in my costume and then you took me to the cafeteria, <laughs> pushed me in. <laughs> and we had a chase. I remember on the elevators. We were on the elevators and every door would open and there was more security at every floor. Remember, we went up and down and up and down. <laughs> they were trying to throw us out and we hit every button in the elevator to the stop to speak to whoever was there. We had a new audience every time. That was the window, every time the, day. The, <laughs> that was the high point of our visit, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and then they were pretty rough, though, as I recall. I was trying to have a Texas accent. I was yeah. trying to be like a New York, not New York. I was trying to be like a Texas preacher. You remember? And, yeah. and Reagan had just died. Yeah. You were like, Ronald Reagan is what is burning in hell <laughs> because oh. he's causing war and destruction. He's killing children. He's bombing people. I just talked to the Lord God Almighty just a half hour ago. Ronnie is burning. And of course, in the heart of Ronnie's. I don't know. Yeah. I have a feeling right now that it's important to be honest 
it's important to be transparent more than ever, to, to say what we mean and to say it together, to find a real affinity groups and, and really try to exist in community. And I just want to share that with people. It's a very difficult moment to become an activist. And it's also a very difficult moment to persist in one's activism. But I'm feeling more and more like I'm sure of certain things. I'm sure of the importance of community in there, the resilience it gives you, the endurance. What, what, sure kind of, yeah. what kind of audiences are you getting? Are younger people who are old time Neil Young fans, a mix? It's a mix. Environmentalist. It's a, mix. Lot of, it's a lot of it's a lot of older people, I would say. And there's some real diehard fans out there who just follow town to town. I didn't really realize how rabid his fans were. And and then there's a mix because the music's great and the music stays great. A lot of people heard him as a child and so they their parents played him or their aunt and uncle or their cousin and it's a pretty big mix actually. I would say almost uniformly white. That's no surprise. And I would say definitely older, actually a great audience to recruit activists from because probably a lot of them are retired. Anthony Probably. Blinken. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Anthony Blinken. He did. He covered Rock in the Free Rock World in Ukraine, Ukraine the other day. That? That's one of the most uh, commodified songs, I think, ever. That be used by all these right wingers, yeah, who don't listen to the lyrics, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> and Springsteen had the same problem. He gets stuff stolen from him. Yeah. Born in the USA, yeah. And there's a, my understanding is there's an eco village where y'all have also been showing up. I believe in Atlanta, maybe y'all sang for Tortiquita's mother. Yeah. Mad props to Charles Ford for setting up the eco village in all of these cities and collecting and recruiting and organizing activists from all kinds of different groups in every place. And they come together and it's really great to just be with them. Everything from Cop City to Third Act to Rock the Vote to... Tortuguito's mom had a table. She was not... <laughs> She's trying to start a, a was... peace and healing uh, retreat institute. Mm -hmm. And that's her response to her son being murdered by the Atlanta police trying to stop Cop City in the Walani Forest. Now, a year and a half ago? Two? two, two year. Wow, time, a year. A little, little over a year ago. February of two of 2023 in his tent so that's um, pretty heavy logistical 30 30 dates and seven activists groups from each city so that that's a they're taking the time and they put that village right where the ticket buyers have to walk through yeah, you have to walk through it you have to encounter it center for biological diversity is there a lot with the polar bears and so that's great. I love that there's always an animal representative at the show that moves me to pieces and just all kinds of people out there. And of course, at any tabling situation, people are a little shy to approach the table, but once they come in, I think they're quite engaged and they learn a lot. And there's things that they're handing out and giving away. And it's just another part of that circle that Neil made with us and the Eco Village and then the name of the tour, Love Earth. So he has a song, Love Earth, Earth. It's a like a kind of mournful bird in a forest. Love Earth, repetition of that phrase, which is such a sweet phrase, but it's completely radical as well. And he gets 20,000 people to sing it at the same time. And then our sermons are keyed on that phrase. So we try to bring the unlikely title of the, you got to, there aren't a lot of examples of such a commercial form being so thoroughly invaded. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's pretty impressive. We're really glad to be a part of it. I, I have one other question. I don't know if I, I know y'all also are probably y'all are doing a lot is my understanding. So I don't know if Bob, I don't want to keep y'all too long. I don't know if Bob has any other questions. No, I think we, we've had a good discussion about just the role of art and resistance. I don't know if you want to say something else about that, just how important things like music and art are and our political awakening and our resistance. Very important. Scott, you and I have talked about this. Relative quiet in the culture when the stakes couldn't be higher, but the, the social movements that from the 20th century where so much of the freedom that we enjoy right now 
were guaranteed by people who sacrificed from labor all the way through ACT UP and just all those amazing movements. They all had music and comedians and writers and they had an avalanche of brilliant eccentric yeah, artists and why stop at the 20th century music is like the original technology right this is the first thing that humans did right mm -hmm. this is what made us humans you know they say that song came before language so i would just say you use the most ancient technology we have to open up the soul the vanguard and you use it in the vanguard you use it in front of the culture and you space with it and I have to say, though, whatever it is you do, just do it. If it's music or art or gardening, I think critical also is just to do something with other people. And we're artists, so that's what we do. That's our toolbox. That's how we live. And, and those are the skills we possess. But honestly, everyone possesses skills. And also, humans are so competent. We're so good at learning things. So I also think we could just all learn some new skills together. And then that's a great way to start a movement, right? Skill sharing. Scott, I remember that, that one time we get really drunk together and, and you, you promised me. A, you taught me how to embroider. Uh, for that. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm here for. It's a crib. That's what we do in the Bay area. The, the, the We drink Guinness and embroider. What's the quality of life. That's what that is. You were going to get me a big grant from the environmental defense fund. You don't remember this, but the idea you were going to line that up. I'm still waiting for my grant for that from them. Okay. You had a lot of Guinness that night. Huh? <laughs> yeah, it goes down nice, doesn't it? Was it was at uh, John Swift. I, I remember being at the Jonathan Swift. Uh, what's it called? The well, I just uh, think Swift's Iberian Lounge. I do think music and art are important because they help us explain things we don't have explanations for. They help us look at things from a different angle and i think right now that's really important because if you stare too long from any one direction right now you just get very sad or depressed or angry and so it, it, it's really important to walk around the backside and look at it from another angle and poetry music the creative arts and all their forms like are really good at helping us do that in the same way i think walking into the forest can do that or Walking into nature, if you, if you need a perspective shift, yeah, sure, listen to some music, but even better, go outside. Yeah. People, just go out. Go into that forest. Go, go into that meadow. Sky. That mangrove swamp, that alpine meadow. Put that your face in the dirt. Coral reef. That'll change you. But whatever it is, change and be changed. That's what the call is now. Change and be changed. And don't be afraid of the change. Amen. Earth, My hallelujah. My my last Got question. It. My last question doesn't is, have to be Scott. Well, but maybe yeah, we we can keep going. We're on this uh, bus for days. <laughs> when I first met you and became familiar with your work, you were doing campaign work around Starbucks and Disney with very much this anti-consumer stuff. I think actually, when I, that weekend that you came to Houston, we went to a, a training that you did on how to creatively disrupt a Starbucks. And then I also seen you work on Wall Street related to climate and fossil fuels around mountaintop removal and pipelines and things like that. And in, in over the last 20 years or since you've since the choir the Church of Stop Shopping has started, how have you seen the sort of art and activism evolve, and change and just your thoughts on that, but particularly around the Church of Stop Shopping? To me it's a form of direct action, which is my religion in a way. But I'm curious about your thoughts on that. There, there. I see. I see the answer being uh, positive, and then also what Sabji just said: the power of consumerism. Just is you cannot overestimate how devastating that has been to our movement and to the earth generally. But the the positives that I see are like Zod in uh, France and uh, XR in London. People who are like consciously discovering ritual in ways of living, but I like it when I see ritual not becoming isolated. Don't go to the center of art where there's very little possibility. You can make a movement. Don't go away from people to have your ritual. There's a lot of that going on, and, and it's easier to have that ritual. You know, I don't want to name any place because I've got friends everywhere. But you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. We're in the middle. We're in the middle of New York City just not known for its environmental movement. We're staying there. 
a lot of people left at COVID. We're staying there because we're trying to solve when the earth is present as a strip of blue sky above you with a single screaming seagull. And then there's a little a little tree next to you exhausted on the traffic island. You you want to find a way for the earth to come into the center of the most yeah, uh, paved. I think that I would get out of the negative, positive view of anything at this point. I, I don't know if it's helping us to look at things through any of that, that particular qualitative analysis of what's good and bad, because the failure is so complete across systems to stop. We know that conservation helps animals, right? We read that study and we're like, yay, conservation works. But like the total picture is just, oh, okay, Atlantic currents are slowing down. <laughs> right, okay. Uh, yeah. all size hail all the time. But the, the thing I do think is that if I was going to, I think people have forgotten how to have meetings which is a really major piece of movement building and art making, creativity making of things. Um, hmm. What I see is a a memory loss there. Mm -hmm. uh, that people have forgotten how to have meetings and to be together in uh, in space together, making decisions together. And and I feel this is a, a dangerous problem in our movements right now. Da I don't want to say dangerous in some weird way, but like. Um, it's a problem and, and, and it's something we all need to like look at and say, oh, why don't we have meetings anymore? We have meetings on signal. Like <laughs> that's not a meeting. The thread is not a meeting. Okay. So right. some really basic kind of tools that we developed over centuries, millennia, which we need to keep doing those. Those are practices, right? Those are creative practices. Democracy is a creative practice, right? right. We do to get right decision-making. It's a creative practice. If we don't practice it, we can't do it. I would just ask people to try to have meetings. And also another little piece of it is that I, I, a very encouraging thing I have witnessed and seen is the centering of indigenous people in our earth movements has just been deeply moving for me and personally to give over and watch that and be part of that in any ways the most encouraging thing I've seen in the last 20 years of my work and to go to COP26 in Glasgow and really feel the indigenous presence there and know that they are not being told, they are actually talking the whole time they're there. They're hoarse because they've spoken to so many people. And so that's very encouraging. And I hope more and more of that, please. I want to ask you a question about religion, Reverend Billy, Church of Stop Shopping. And I know that's a Years ago, when Scott and I were in the streets, I, I used to do that, hold like the manifesto or the wealth of nations as a Bible. And it, it really seemed to work well. I just wondered how you chose to take that route, Reverend Billy, with a church and, and how important that is to give people like a secular religion or something like that. Savitri and I are dancing through that fire. Savitri's parents published and edited Be Here Now and started the Lama Foundation in Taos. I was raised by destructive Calvinists from Holland to Michigan, from the Dutch Reformed Church, the opposite of Lama Mountain, I would say. <laughs> and then I was adopted by a renegade Episcopal rogue preacher. So we've both been, we know the power of religion and we, we know that consumerism is like the modernity's fundamentalist religion. We know that lots of People learn about life from very simple morality tales that resemble Bible stories. We see it all in evidence all around. And we don't go around bragging that we're like agnostics or something. It's not, we're, we're aware of the power and we, we want to be realistic about the power. But there's nothing like a walk in the forest, as far as I'm concerned, as far as religiosity. But yeah, I'm still the performance art goof on the right-wing apocalyptic preacher i'm still when people see me up on neil's stage that's i'm i got my white suit my big elvis hair and i'm still trying to undermine that that basic wing of religion in this country which is still so strong and is so anti-earth it's hard satire is hard because you have to let them hate you right? Like you have to be close enough to the thing they hate to be hated. And then it turns out you actually want to be liked. So it's a confusing swirl of 
conflicting desires in a or feedback systems in the satire. And then it is a Christian nation. We know there are lots of other religions in the U.S., but our laws and the way things are set up and what's favored and the stories we tell. We are living in a Christian nation, largely. I think it's, you can't just ignore that, pretend that's not happening. It's good to relate to it on some level. I think it's, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's very charged. I think religion is a, a charged and hot button type thing with almost every person, however atheistic or agnostic they claim to be. People have feelings, strong feelings about it, strong reactions, strong responses. It's a nice fertile ground for political and creative activity. And I find myself when preaching, I want to say the earth is alive, intelligent, conscious. So I'm like treading on the Gaia there, bringing in the Gaia concept. Yeah, we have some schism on these topics. It, it's been interesting. To... Savagery doesn't necessarily want me to do that. I'm a victim <laughs> of the new age. I, I grew up in Taos, New Mexico. What do you want me to do? Like, watch out. <laughs> Careful there. But the, the earth the is the activist. That's another one of our, the wildfires and the superstorms. The earth is the activist. It's the most effective activist right now. The earth is expressing. The earth is making statements. And that's all, that's all earth culture wisdom being dragged to the front page of USA Today. So that's another one of our experiments. How can you take earth culture wisdom and walk with it? Is it portable? I guess if you're a colonist, everything is portable. Right? Uh, fuck. Slash I, out. See? I got nailed there. Yeah. Soft, she's my director. She doesn't often get up on stage and actually take the microphone from me, but she will go on national podcasts and take me down. Traveled. We don't mind if the first photo that people have of me and the choir is, oh, that's a cult. That's a church. They can think that as long mm -hmm. as... 20 minutes later, we're sailing with this extinction yeah. of the forest that's just barely visible over the top, tippy top of the amphitheater. They're alive watching this. It's where you go. It's how far you get. Actually, it makes me think because you do that on stage, but I've also seen you do that in the street many times. And there's where people see you doing a performance, but then there's where I may have even been with you from time to time where you've walked into a bank lobby and done this as well and created this spectacle and this sort of shock and because they're like what is this thing happening right now is this a cult what's going on here but then also then you're communicating this kind of powerful message around earth activism and the climate crisis and etc and i think that's a I just actually, I think a lot of people learn from that. And there's a, that's an important role that y'all have played through all of my activism anyway. You've at least played that role for me. You've been a, you've been a teacher for me in that regard. Sovereignty, we're going to go back to the activism, aren't we? Yeah, these tools. When we get off the road. <laughs> a little bit distracted. We miss it. We miss it. We miss the. Yeah, I start to feel a little bit like, what am I doing? Oh my God. Oh my God. It's been it's a plus the four. I once, I was at the Re Republican National Convention in 2004, and y'all had taken over an intersection where you were reciting the First Amendment to the NYPD yeah. with about 300 <laughs> of us standing there with you, yeah. repeating it after you were saying it. Yeah. Congress shall make no law <laughs> expecting an establishment of religion or abridging the exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or abridging the freedom of press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and petition the government for redress of grievances, free speech, free press, free people. Protest. Amen. We can make a new schoolhouse rock out of that. <laughs> I know you're I know you're rich, Bob. I know I because I know you're rich because you trimmed your beard so nice. Oh. <laughs> so I want you to finance that movie just when we get off this bus. Yeah. <laughs> We've had enough success. I think we, we have to just go back to the streets now. You know, I was gonna ask you, you've been doing this for a long time now. Has the how's the response changed from when you started to now or easier to get along or people more skeptical or i would say in recent years it's been more difficult back in the early oddies there there was a 
you remember the March for Peace in February 15th, 2003, there was like 800 cities all in the city. We have had Black Lives Matter and Standing Rock and Occupy, wonderful things that have happened and we've shown up at them, whether it was Ferguson or New York City. But gradually the Earth's effort to balance and evolve the sixth extinction has gotten, it's just accelerating. Yeah, also I think you, I'm sure you two know this as well as we do, like the social media segregation is real. It's mm. harder and harder to connect who don't already know you or haven't already heard of you. Or We're shadow banned. We, we're shadow banned. So like a tour like uh, this where we're going to talk to half a million people is amazing. Not because we want to monetize it, but because we actually want to talk to we're, them. We're, we're in person. <laughs> we're communicating. So in person, it's amazing. Us, you know, yeah, yeah. Say, I'd say um, when we are able to talk to people, the response remains incredibly and there's a lot of traction in the conversation we have with people. However, the barriers to that conversation are thicker than ever. We're not alone in that. We're going to work. We're going to work to uh, overcome those barriers, break down those walls, get right. back into life, have those meetings, <laughs> be on the streets together. And we have developed ways to get along with the electronic revolution and its atomization of everything. We have developed a, it's a sort of a veggie powered nuclear yeah. bomb. It's going to drop on Silicon Valley very soon. It's like uh, a combination of soul, nuclear drone. <laughs> That's our ticket, right? That's, we're going to retire on that. And Scott, your even handed calm is going to be very important yeah. for us. Yeah. That's what I'm here you'll for. Be, uh, you'll be our spokesperson. We'll ban teleprompters. Uh, the, well, uh, well, I'm hoping the, the electronic the magnetic pulse bomb. from the bomb will just take out <laughs> at least the West Coast, if yeah. not Silicon Valley's sort of ability to get online. Don't take away the wordle. Don't take away the wordle. Take away the grammarly. <laughs> destroy, the, destroy that. Yeah. Wordle. We need that. We still need that. And you're Sorry. talking about... Choose what must be turned just calm. And And talking about getting past the social media segregation... You also have a, a podcast called Earth Riot Radio, yeah, yeah. which is, is, I've been following it and it's it's getting out there. Is there anything that the audience should know about Earth Riot Radio? And also, this is the tour called, it's not called Earth Riot, Earth Riot Tour though, right? No, it's called Love Earth. Love Earth. Love Earth. Love Earth. It's called Love Earth and our radio show is called Earth Riot Radio and, and it is also a podcast. It's, I think, in about 70... 70, 75, uh, 75 terrestrial radio, radio stations. stations play it. It's 30 minutes. It's got music. Um, it's funny. I uh, do like a 10 minute news segment, news from the natural world, which is, synthesizes a, a week in science from a non, not necessarily human perspective. And it's, I think it's a pretty good show. We've done a lot of them. We've, so go check them out. Earth Radio. You were on our first back in the. Oh yeah, that's days. right. That's right. I forgot so about that. Get that started, Scott. Yeah, we've many episodes. So if you like it, there's no shortage. And because you were there at the beginning and you helped encourage us, we want to give you, we would give you $50 million, but instead we're going to send you a bill. <laughs> For coming on. Folks, that was the co-founders of the Church of Stop Shopping, Reverend Billy and Savitri D. So hope you enjoyed that. And if you like what you're listening to, check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit the subscribe button. If you're listening to this on an audio platform, please give us a rate and review. And if you really like us, check us out. On, or If you really like us, go to our website, greenredpodcast.org, and hit that support button. Or become a patron at patreon.com backslash greenrest, green red podcast. And we'll talk to you again soon. Misbehave. Earthaluya, all that good stuff. Talk to you soon.